This video is an excerpt from Good Judgment's Autumn Summit 2020. The conversation features Professor Philip Tetlock. Professor Tetlock is an Annenberg University professor at the University of Pennsylvania. He's the co-principal investigator of the Good Judgment Project and is an author of many books, including the most recent, Super Forecasting, The Art and Science of Prediction. The interview is hosted by Dr. Warren Hatch, a super forecaster himself and the CEO of Good Judgment. Again, great to see you all. And what I want to do is start now um, with just um, a, a, a high level question for Phil. And, um, and it's timely too, because some new data has been released. And what we know now is the super forecasters have hit the trifecta. First, there was the Good Judgment Project in the original uh, IARPA study, ACE, um, where, as, uh, as most of us here know, this, the Good Ju Team Good Judgment decisively outperformed the other university-based research teams, and within the Good Judgment Team, the super forecasters uh, crushed it. Um, and uh, in particular, on a subset, also opposed to intelligence analysts, the super forecasters outperformed by 30%. So that was victory number one. Then victory number two was in the hybrid forecasting competition, which was a follow-on research project that, uh, that, was, uh, that went part way. And the idea there was to come up with ways of combining humans and machines to outperform humans alone, to, to really press those frontiers. And, and, and I think a, a lot of us do agree that the future is hybrid, and the purpose of the HFC research initiative was to, to find what combinations would really advance forecast accuracy even more. However, there too, the super forecasters on their own as humans outperformed uh, all of the other research teams, and the uh, preliminary data that we've been getting says that number is by about 20%. And now we have the third one. Uh, which is what Phil has been working on along with uh, his colleagues and, and, uh, and others on, um, uh, on focus. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll hear from Phil a little bit more about what that is. But once again, university-based research teams and, and other teams uh, were in competition to, uh, to, to, to deliver uh, uh, better insight. And once again, the super forecasters as a benchmark decisively outperformed all of the other uh, the other teams by somewhere in the neighborhood of 55 percent. So a trifecta um, um, that all of which involves super forecasters and all of which, of course, one way or another involves Phil Tetlock. And so maybe that's a way to start, Phil, is um, is uh, what do you make of the super forecasters performance as individuals, as teams, uh, the role of training, the role of aggregation in really delivering this uh, pretty stunning uh, track record. And Phil, I think you're on mute. Uh, thanks, Warren. Uh, you're, you're right. It is a pretty replicable phenomenon, the, um, the, the uh, outperformance of super forecasters across the three very different IARPA tournaments over a 10 year period. Um, and but the winning strategies um, uh, are more or less invariant. I mean, there, there is there is a recruitment process of identifying and tracking the, the, the super forecasters into elite teams. Uh, there's a there, there is a training process. Uh, there's a teaming process and there's an aggregation process. Um, and each of them makes a contribution uh, to the total margin of victory. Um, uh, each of them is, I think, reasonably imitatable. Uh, so it's surprising that the margins of victory haven't shrunk more than they have. Um, but the I, I think we know more or less what, 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 what the key components of the winning strategy are. And in recent work, uh, led by a very creative young statistician in France at, at the business school INSEAD outside of Paris, uh, Vila Sadapop, uh, who's developed a VIN model. It's going to be appearing in management science next year. Um, we, we now know a lot more also about the uh, more precise mechanisms by which each of the components of the winning strategy uh, deliver superior performance. 
the bin model basically says that there are three pathways via which any intervention that improves forecasting will do so. One of them is by improving the skill of the forecasters or the forecasting system at extracting signals from the environment. Uh, the second is by tamping down systematic biases, and the third is by tamping down noise. Um, and uh, in, in this really re elegant paper, which I'm, I would, will be glad to share with people in the next few weeks, um, the uh, you, you can see in, in, in re with really pre pretty graphics uh, exactly what proportion of the improvement variance is attributable to signal, improve signal extraction, bias reduction, and noise reduction. And the, 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 more, the somewhat surprising result, I mean, all of them are involved, but the somewhat surprising result is the outsized role of noise reduction. Um, now, this is, of course, going to be a forthcoming theme from a new book by, by Danny Kahneman next year called Noise, um, which he's writing with Cass Sunstein and Olivier Siboni in, from France. And, um, uh, they, 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 they very much emphasize that, that noise is probably a greater uh, obstacle uh, uh, in human judgment uh, than, than, than bias. And of course, Kahneman has made, made, made a fabulous career out of focusing on bias. Uh, and as I recall, Phil, there was an, I'm sorry, there was an earlier paper that broke it down to roughly 50% uh, noise reduction and then a 25 and 25 to bias mitigation and information improvement. Is, are those the general ratios that you've been seeing? I think Michael Mabasan wrote a nice summary paper on, 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 on the Vila Sadapal model. And um, it did vary. It, 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 I, I think as a gist, that's not bad. Uh, it, it, it depends on the method and depends on the where in the forecasting period we're talking about. Um, for example, noise does come down as you get closer and closer to the outcome. But that's, that's, that's a reasonable gist. And so if you were to gist what noise reduction, the, the uh, one or two or three tools that people could readily apply to improve noise reduction, what might those be? Yeah, well, the, the, the Kahneman book is full of suggestions like this, uh, but unfortunately it's not available yet. Uh, but there, is, there are things that have appeared in, in, the, in the public literature, and, and one of them is the concept of a noise audit. Uh, and that, that essentially involves uh, being very systematic and, and, and structuring your, decomposing your judgment process in, into uh, uh, the simplest possible units, uh, assessing how much different people, how, how much variance there is and how people interpret each unit and trying to tamp down that noise. Um, so if I were to say there are two basic strategies I see that we're using in focus right now. One of them is a variant of, 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 the, um, of the noise audit. And the other is um, uh, resorting to algorithms. Uh, as, as you said, uh, you know, the hybrid, hybrids are the future. And uh, we, we have some very smart statisticians in focus who have developed uh, some techniques that will allow uh, novice forecasters, people who don't have a lot of experience doing this sort of thing, to make pretty accurate judgments um, without actually using a probability scale. And people, uh, regular forecasters, often have a lot of trouble using probability scales. Probability is not a natural way of thinking, but thinking in terms of causality is a more natural way of thinking, uh, we find. And um, you, we've, we have automatic conversion formulas for you. Yeah, where people make estimates of whether an effect size is small, medium, or large, and we convert that into a, a probability distribution. So that's all a little bit cryptic, and it's all you know in the focus inside baseball world. But the, the two basic ways are structuring human judgment via noise audits and simply getting rid of human judgment via algorithms. Right, when, when possible. Uh, and there's uh, somebody uh, wrote in a question here too that builds on 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 this topic. And the question is: the super forecasters typically are unusually well calibrated in their forecasts. When they say 60%, things tend to happen six out of ten times. Is this exceptionally good calibration a contribution to noise reduction? Uh, yes, it, it's hard to be well calibrated if you're noisy. I agree. 
And related to that too, here's another question that kind of, how important is a strong foundation in math and probabilities to super forecasting? Can you be bad at math and still get super forecaster? And maybe this relates to the training too. Um, and uh, I, uh, I believe that's part of focus as well is the transferable ability of training and, and skills. Is, uh, does that, is that part of that too? Yeah. Well, one of the things we're trying to do in focus is, is focus has now moved into a new phase in which the goal is to deliver the most effective systems for training intelligence analyst trainees uh, in making accurate probability assessments. Uh, and um, so that 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 is. Um, <clears throat> That, that so it's no longer a super forecaster versus others kind of horse race situation. The, 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 the focus of focus has, has become very pedagogical. Um, and we, we are developing very specific tools that help people who don't know a lot of math uh, to um, translate their hunches into probability distributions. Um, uh, so the, 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 the algorithms handle the conversion from causality to probability. Um, now, there's a, I'm a little bit of hand waving here because of course it hinges on what kind of a probability distribution you're talking about. It's pretty straightforward. If, if, you, if you know it, it's going to be a kind of a Gaussian or normal, uh, normal kind of curve. Uh, but if, um, if it's exponential or if there are various other you know, types of probabilities is distributions that have that are uh, less well behaved um, that, 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 that raises an, its own set of deep complications. Um, but we, we are doing our best right now to help you know just raise the basic level of performance of analyst trainees uh, with a minimal of training effort. Um, and the ways of doing that are to, as, as I say, to, to, to structure the task very, very clearly for people uh, and not ask people to make categories of judgments that they don't have um, maybe the math background for making, like um, judgments about probability distributions. And there's, um, well, I remember um, in the in the uh, during the research project, there was a study that, that, that Barb ran, if I recall correctly, where there were two groups split in two. Some got some training about probabilities and the other half did not. And there was a gap that opened up between the two groups in subsequent accuracy right away that persisted uh, from there. So a little bit of training goes a long way if it's carefully targeted. Yeah, it's not either or. Um, and we're doing we're doing a lot of training experiments inside focus and you, know, you can imagine combinations of things to teach people you don't have to completely shut people out of the probability process um, you, you know one way of doing it is to shut them out completely uh, but another way of doing it is to bring people is to give people some very basic tutorials on probability and help them nudge them nudge them along as it were um, so, but, but yeah, that's right. It, 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 it's, it's surprising how much uh, bang for your buck you can get from uh, fairly brief training interventions. Well, and, and part of focus too, just before we move on to uh, some another topic that's coming up here is within focus and the role of counterfactuals and how we think about that, the skills of being accurate in a, in a simulated world and how we transfer that to, to the real world is there anything you can you can share about how that has been progressing? Yeah, um, well, I'm I, you know the term historical counterfactual I guess is a pretty familiar term, um, and and the big problem with historical counterfactuals in the real world is that there's no way there's no gold standard of accuracy. There's no way to know, for example, uh, how history would have unfolded if the Archduke hadn't been assassinated. Would we have gotten World War One? There's no way to know whether we would have gotten World War II if Hitler had died in the trenches in World War II. Uh, there's no way to know whether we would have gotten World War III if, uh, you know, a U.S. destroyer had had um, launched a death charge that destroyed a Soviet nuclear submarine. Um, so there's no way. I mean, there are lots of imponderables in real-world counterfactual history. So what, one of the reasons why IARPA decided in focus to, to focus on simulated worlds is because we can rerun history in simulations and we can assess what the real probab probability distributions are 
if you alter particular moves along the timeline. Uh, so that's a big advantage. It's also, of course, a big disadvantage because simulations are artificial. But if you want to use simulations as a tool for um, encouraging cognitive agility among analyst trainees, uh, it probably is the way to go. I look forward to hearing more on that. I know because um, my previous background was in um, Soviet and Russian studies, and there were a lot of counterfactual movements moments in the closing days. There, I remember talking about with uh, students and, and uh, professors at the time, wish we had been better equipped to analyze these things more carefully. Like, what if one of Gorbachev's rivals had uh, taken the reins instead and been endorsed by Andrei Gromyko instead of Gorbachev, and they stayed on a kind of an era of stagnation for another decade? It was this close. It could have, could have happened. And I look forward to being able to think more structured about those things. Yeah, absolutely. Um... And um, and that kind of leads to uh, naturally to another part of the research uh, uh, in uh, in the original Good Judgment project. I remember at one of the conferences that you all organized for us as super forecasters, there was um, uh, a presentation, a slide that you had. I think it was you, it was you or Terry, about the rigor relevance trade-off. And one of the things about having really good forecast questions as it gets narrower and narrower and narrower, the more rigorous it becomes, the less relevant it becomes to the, the, the larger strategic issues you're trying to understand. And I get the reason for that, because if you don't have rigorous questions, you end up with questions that go horribly wrong, like uh, the classic one that uh, uh, Mark Kohler and I still arm wrestle about, w w will construction begin on the Nicaragua Canal, right? And, and and there was a lot of discussion. What does construction actually mean? And by the time it gets adequately defined, it has lost all connection with the bigger strategic question. And I know there's been a lot more. But we've done we've done work with clients too on this idea of pushing out the frontier by having multiple questions, clusters of questions. And and uh, I know you've been doing more work out there. What what might we uh, be thinking about with with this group and um, and be trying out in uh, in their organizations? Well, a few years ago, I proposed something to IARPA called a notion of second generation forecasting tournaments, in which the um, in which the focus would not only be on the accuracy of the answers people generate, it would also be on the uh, incisiveness. Of the um, of the questions uh, in in the tournament itself, uh, so an incisive question is a question that when a policymaker sees it says, "Yeah, I really want to know the answer to that question." Or if the policymaker sees it after the fact, is, "I really wish I had known the answer to that question." Um, so these are questions that um, that people really do care about, and there's a tension between asking questions that people really care about and asking questions that are rigorously resolvable in the short term and they give human forecasters feedback on how good they are and how accurate they are. So it depends on what you want to use a forecasting tournament for. If you want to use a forecasting tournament for identifying talent, cultivating talent, testing which methods improve probability estimation, the current first generation of forecasting tournaments do it for you. However, if you want to use forecasting tournaments to address more strategic questions facing your organization, uh, then I think second generation tournaments are where you need to go. And that requires shifting your level of abstraction up a few notches. Uh, so, you know, one, one, of, one of the areas in which we've uh, uh, done some work with uh, second generation tournaments is the, uh, you know, very abstract, you know, the kind of Davos level abstraction thing, a fourth industrial revolution scenario. Uh, are, are we are we in the early stages of a fourth industrial revolution that's driven by strong forms of artificial intelligence that's going to cause major dislocations in white collar labor markets by 2035, 2040, 2045? And if we are on that trajectory, what sorts of things would you expect to observe in 2015, 16, 17, 18, 20, 21, 21 in, 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 the, in the current in the current time frame? And we, we started this around 2015, so that's why I go back that far. Um, and you can identify very specific indicators that each of which have some relevance to the big thing, the big scenario theme, uh, and that are comprehensive.
collection thing. You want you want items that are highly correlated with 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 a, with a criterion variable, but are minimally correlated with each other. But you have to be correlated with the same thing at the same time. So it's, it's not not a, it's a tricky balancing act. Um, and uh, when you do that, you do that. You come. You get people, subject matter experts, play a key role here, and and they they uh, do 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 come up with some quite incisive questions. You know, one early one, which actually worked out in favor of the fourth industrial revolution hypothesis or scenario, it was that Lee Sedol would win the Go Championship, or, or the AlphaGo would defeat Lee Sedol in, in the in the Go Championship, and that was a victory, of course, for the AI, AI hypothesis. Another was people expecting driverless cars to be picking passengers up for fares in American cities by the end of 2018 or 2019. Uh, I don't think that's happened. Um, another was um, a um, an AI system defeating a fighter pilot in a U.S. Air Force dogfight competition. That did actually happen just about a month or two ago. Um, another it had to do with uh, mm, robotic spending in the U.S. exceeding various threshold levels. It's lagged a bit, and so it's not quite there. Um, so there's a whole series of questions you can imagine posing in different spheres of life. And Watson MD defeating um, you know, IBM's Watson system with one jeopardy. Uh, defeating the world's best oncologists in, in a cancer diagnosis tournament. Uh, that did not happen. That didn't even come close to happening. Uh, so there are, um, you know, successes and failures for the fourth industrial revolution scenario. And uh, people can accordingly update their views about how, pro how, how, how compelling or not so compelling the scenario is in a more systematic way. Uh, you can have a kind of a, 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 a a dashboard of um, early warning, early opportunity indicators, indicating which of these, you know, otherwise hopelessly vague scenario trajectories is actually becoming more or less likely over an extended period of time. Uh, and um, um, we've done some some cluster work, and, and um, as we think about this too, some of the some of the work you've been doing fits this into a, a, a broader framework, the full inference cycle tournament concept is that still a good way to think about it to have an ongoing system that uh, revisits these issues on a on a constant basis oh i, I i'm still pretty sold on that idea yes uh it's, it's a hard thing to implement but but it, i think it is worth implementing and it's so you really in a full inference cycle process you start with two opposing camps that have conflicting views of you know, Chinese geopolitical intent or Russian geopolitical intent or the stability of the Eurozone or you know, conflicting views on important topics. And you get them uh, to go through a process, a structured process uh, in which the first steps are pretty are some pretty qualitative, although they have a quantitative component. You, you get each side to demonstrate that it can just to the other side's satisfaction, the other side's position. So I, if, I, can I accurately represent your position to your to your satisfaction? That, that's, a, that's a necessary but not sufficient condition for any meaningful debate to go forward. Uh, but once we've managed, once we've shown that you know, we have some you know minimal mutual respect for each other's positions, then it's possible to start um, fermionizing and decomposing the differences into resolvable questions and question clusters. Uh, that have the potential to tip debates, and you can see forecasting tournaments that way, and some interesting question clusters can emerge that way. I look forward to doing more with that. And I know that some people who are here on the call are actively thinking of ways to, to do that, so hopefully they'll have a chance to follow up with questions as well about what they might be up to to the degree they're comfortable doing so. But I also see some other questions here that build on what we're talking about here. Um, AI in particular, here's um, someone posing the question, what are the latest research findings with regards to wisdom of the crowds and super forecasters? Does AI help? And uh, what, what is the improvement? Um, well, a lot hinges on what exactly we mean by AI or machine learning. Um, you know, in the hybrid forecasting competition that Warren mentioned earlier, um, the goal was to incentivize each of the performing research teams uh, to develop um, combinations that had a, an algorithmic component and a human component. Um, and the algorithms that they developed were, I think, mostly, you know, variances, variants of um, multiple regression and time series analysis. Um, and um, 
you know, they do moderately well. They do they do about as well as you can do when there are um, reasonably low noise trends in the world with uh, not too many exogenous shocks. Um, but of course, when 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 um, when change occurs, uh, or, as, or as Karl Marx once, 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 once joked, they said, when the train of history hits a curve, the intellectuals fall off. Well, it's not just the intellectuals off in the early 21st century, the algorithms fall off too. Um, and uh, so they don't perform very well under, under, under those conditions. Now, of course, people don't do that well either. Uh, but the algorithms do, do you know, relative to super forecasters, uh, say, do, we do even worse. Um, not that the super forecasters can, you know, anticipate trend with great accuracy either. I mean, this is extremely difficult. Um, um, I, I, that's a partial answer. I guess we'd have to decompose the term AI with with, with more precision, and um, that it could could be a long conversation. You know, AI could mean computational linguistics. It could mean lots of different things. Um, I, I'm just focusing on the more statistical machine learning aspects of AI right now, and then the way they've been applied to forecasting. But, but um, at least at least for the very near term, the role of humans is, is, is not been overtaken. Right, so yes, that's part of the fourth industrial revolution scenario is the question cluster. He says, you know, when a radiologist is going to become obsolete, when a university professor is going to become obsolete, uh, me, uh, when our um, the various when intelligence analysts and, and so forth, and um, it would seem that uh, radiologists may be in some degree of danger. Um, air, airline pilots probably, you know, it's looming, but it's not there, and people are going to be really reluctant to get on planes anyway, with, with which they're just driven by um, um, AI. But other things may be sooner. And uh, well, and here's a related question to that too, uh, in a way, and that is. Um, uh, hybrid models. Um, has there been any attempt to bring the burgeoning movement in baseball operations and analytics into the forecasting academic field? And I, and I can say we've heard from quite a few sports organizations um, in the, in Europe for football or soccer, uh, plus football regular here and, and basketball. Most of them, most of those inquiries and, and discussions have been in baseball. What do you make of that? What do you think about that? Right. Well, you know, of course, there are lots of people in basketball, Daryl Morey and others. I mean, yeah, there, there, there is. It's, it's really gratifying to see how, um, you know, the influence of Moneyball, broadly defined, uh, has, has gone international. Um, uh, it, 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 it's, it's a bit of an unfair. It was all it was never really a very fair competition. You know, it, we've known since the year I was born, 1954, you know, Paul psychologist of the 20th century wrote, wrote a book on clinical versus actuarial prediction. And even back in 1954, the evidence was mounting that when you compared human judges to actual simple actuarial models, you know, predicting things like uh, recidivism of prisoners or uh, psychiatric uh, psychiatric patients or you know, ver various categories of outcomes, uh, that the actuarial models were doing consistently better than the, than the human judges. Um, and you know, since then the scorecard has gotten much, much longer. You know, Paul Meal I think only had 25, 20 or twenty-five studies to work with. Uh, but you know, Robin Dawes uh, updated that I think around nineteen eighty, and you know, there were a couple of hundred studies, and now now maybe there are a couple of thousand, maybe more. And the upshot of that is it, it's very it's very hard when uh, humans are working with the same informational inputs as the machines. Um, for humans to do better, and it's even hard, hard for humans to do better when humans have access to more information, uh, as long as the machines have access to the most fundamental uh, information. Oh. This, this, by the way, ties into this no, big noise theme. Uh, that one, one of the one of the findings, one of the more interesting findings in that literature is that. But let's say I'm um, let's say I'm an expert uh, on a baseball scout. And uh, I have a mental model of the cues I look for when I'm scouting people. I'm going to recommend, you know, what to do with the ball players, and I've got their, their various statistics, and I've got impressions of how strong they are and how fast they are, and I, I rate them on some scales, um, and I then make judgments about which ones are have the greatest um, major league potential. Uh, 
And some statistician is, is standing over my shoulder and he's modeling the exact Q utilization strategy I'm using when I'm making these recommendations. He's constructing basically a regression model of my judgment strategy. So you've got a model of Tetlock and you've got Tetlock. So who and then then you put them in competition on a new data set and you say who's going to do a better job of predicting the next year's baseball players. And uh, guess what? The model of Tetlock outperforms Tetlock. Now, how can that be? Because the model is entirely based on inputs from me, right? And and the answer is noise. Actually, it, 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 I, I'm, I'm human beings are very wobbly. So even if I do have some genuine insights about the you know the, the, the predictors of baseball success, I'm going to apply it in a in a kind of a wobbly, inconsistent, noisy way, and the model of me will be much more ruthlessly consistent. Um, and um, so the so-called man versus model of man literature from 30, 40 years ago has also held up very well. That, uh, um, and, that, and that is largely a story about noise. And that, of course, ties into the earlier, earlier point about why when you say, how do you, what are the major paths to noise reduction, structuring the judgment task and, and, and or um, minimizing uh, the human role by replacing humans with algorithms or replacing Tetlock with the model of Tetlock. Um, and does does the real Tetlock get to have access to the model Tetlock? There are lots of interesting variations there, and you know you you can uh, that that that's an interesting thing to do. It hasn't been very done very much in in the research literature, but you it would certainly I think it is an interesting variation. Well, we have a model of you, and the model of you is predicting this. Do you want to talk to the model of you and see you know, <laughs> um, how, how how the model of you is doing this? Um, it, uh, and, and if people knew how well the model performed, would they become more toward the model of themselves? Or would they, how, how, would, how would they react to that? There are all, all sorts of complicated possible social emotional reactions people might have to discovering that the model of themselves is outperforming them, themselves. Uh, well, I, don't, I, don't, maybe, maybe, uh, uh, I think it'd be really interesting to be able to do that as a forecaster is because that might be a trigger for like a pre-mortem, right? If I'm taking in new information and I think I'm really doing a good job of sifting through everything, but the model me that's running parallel is saying, well, wait a second, you're overemphasizing these things and maybe that's a filter, a noise filter too. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there are a couple of other questions here too. Uh, here's a couple that might even go together. The first one is, um, how do you imagine a government institution best performing the intelligence analysis service function? And another question that is uh, different, but perhaps related, what's one single thing can hedgehogs best do to become more fox-like? Um, okay, for, uh, for first, <laughs> it's a huge question. <laughs> Uh, I think we've had a couple of presidential commissions in the last few decades that have tried to take on that question about how um, how better to structure intelligence agencies so we are, are not blindsided by nasty surprises. Um, but also, this, the, you know, the issues that have loomed very large recently in the news is about the politicization of intelligence analysis and and how can I mean in. in the, you know, the director of the CIA, the, the uh, director of the Office of the, 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 director, the, the director of National Intelligence, the head of ODNI, uh, those people are not policymakers. They're not supposed to be policymakers. They're supposed to be fact advisors. They, they, they present facts and the policymakers have value functions. They, they take the facts, they plug their value function in, they make decisions. Um, that's in theory how it works. Of course, it's much blurrier than that. I mean, some directors of national intelligence are de facto policymakers, and um, and sometimes the the the, the values of um, of of, of uh, people in the intelligence community probably do influence uh, their probability assessments. Um, one of the things I've always found very attractive about the forecasting tournament prediction market model for the intelligence community is that it very explicitly separates the fact and the value components of analysis. Um, let's face it, 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 it's just purely about probabilities, right? Tournaments and, and prediction markets, about prices and probabilities. That's, it's all, those are purely factual judgments and people who allow their, their value perspectives, I want this side to win or that side to win, as opposed to basing judgments on evidence, uh, those people are in, 
uh, in short to medium term, going to do pretty badly in forecasting tournaments and prediction markets. And that will become apparent. Uh, so people who uh, sometimes call fact value conflation, people who blur their fact judgments and their value judgments will pay a reputational price. And that will be discovered more rapidly in an organization that institutionalizes things like forecasting tournaments and, um, and prediction markets. So I remain uh, uh, bullish on, on, on that fundamental idea. And I think if anything, you know, the recent you know, years and years now of nasty exchanges over whether intelligence analysis is politicized, I mean, there are some fairly direct ways of addressing that issue in a, in, in a, in a rigorous fashion. Well, and uh, that the the, the uh, prediction markets keys into a couple of other questions here too, and I don't know if you've been following that closely, but there's predicted and the super forecasters. Uh, how do their records compare? Um, and does money on the line improve forecasts like the stock market? I suppose that there's an embedded assumption in that question, but when you think about prediction markets, especially predicted versus uh, super forecasters, what what might uh, you reflect on, especially in the current environment? And I don't know the answer to the question of the relative performance of supers versus predicted or metaculous. And I know some super forecasters actually participate in predicted metaculous, so it would be a messy comparison to make. Um, do I have views about the pros and cons of prediction markets versus forecasting tournaments? I think there are reasons, there are different conditions under which you might prefer each one. Uh, I think there are reasons for prefer, uh, liking hybrids, actually. You're getting, you, you, you actually do get more information when you ask for probabilities as well as for pricing decisions. Um, so um, I, don't, I don't see it as competitive so much, it's complementary. And I see the comparisons you're asking for as messy because uh, the players are are moving around, right? And then super forecasters aren't all segregated on GJ Open. Some of them are in lots of other places. So it's, a, it's a free market of ideas. People are moving around. Um, to, to make those comparisons, we need to do the sorts of experiments we did in some of the ARPA tournaments where you have people randomly assigned to forecasting tournaments and to prediction markets, and you see who, 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 which does better. In our experience, forecasting tournaments with algorithmic assistance, aggregation assistance, do better than prediction markets. Um, but economists retort, well, that's because your markets aren't deep and liquid enough, right? So that's that's the state of the art roughly right now. It's, it's a little bit messy, but I, I, I think it's pretty clear that forecasting tournaments and prediction markets are, are valuable complementary tools. Uh, yeah, when we have um, ongoing conversations with our friends at Predicted and elsewhere, and I think we're we're all kind of out on the frontier, busting sod, and uh, the what we share in common is far more than the differences we we have. Uh, but there's uh, uh, on on markets themselves. Another question is commodity mark futures markets. In theory, all public information on geopolitical, social, or corporate events are baked into commodity futures prices. Can super forecasting techniques improve on the average forecast implied by futures prices, noting that futures prices are often poor predictors of actual prices? Um, I don't know who asked that question, but have you shared with them the, the Alpha Briar paper with Joe Siniglia, who worked with us at Penn for a year or two, uh, and I think who is now at a major investment firm in New York City. Yeah, so whoever asked that question, I'd be delighted to share that with you. Just uh, uh, give it, me a quick uh, email. It's a great question. And um, you know, how do you know, I mean, the generic problem is how do you know whether uh, in any given year is lucky or unlucky or skillful or unskillful? How do you disentangle skill and luck? And the short answer is you have to wait a long time. <laughs> it, it, it requires a great deal of patience. Uh, one possible shortcut is to ask the traders uh, or the people making the decisions about investments and investment strategies to tell you the, their forecasts on issues that are affecting their pricing decisions. So, you know, if you, you had said, for example, that you think the stock market is going to go up in 2016, um, and the reason for that is because Hillary Clinton is going to win the election. Um, 
that counts as a less impressive predictive success for the rise in the stock market um, than it would if you, you see where I'm going with that. Being, you can be right or wrong for the right or wrong reasons. So if you could develop question clusters that shed light on, on whether the investment, the investors are right or wrong for the right or wrong reasons uh, in, a, in a given year, you can draw more accurate inferences about skill versus luck in that year then you then and you don't have to wait five or ten years to see how much they regress toward the mean. Uh, that's the core argument of the Alpha Briar paper, um, and I think it's a reasonable argument. Yep. Yeah. So I'd be happy to share that with anyone who'd like to to see if they haven't already. By by all means, we got a couple of other questions here that have come in. Um, and one is, and the, getting back to some of the earlier topics we were discussing, how does machine model performance change relative to humans for highly irregular events like black swans? Um, well, we don't need to be as extreme as black swans. We can talk about it, kind of a white to gray swan continuum where black, you know, white to black with lots of gray in between, uh, maybe 50 shades of gray. Um, joke. Um, so you would, um, how, I, I think it comes back to what I was saying earlier about, I think I may have mentioned earlier the notion of trends versus shocks, um, and that the machine learning and HFC, for example, tended to do better on those variables that had nice predictable trend qualities to them. You could project a confident time series confidence interval out of the trend and when, when not, Represented the outcomes would indeed fall within the cone of uncertainty from that from that confidence interval. Um, as you move toward world more exogenous shocks and uh, one percent event occur, one one percent events occur, or 0 0.01 or 0 0.00001, way way all the way out, events start to occur, uh, and those events are high impact events, uh, say like COVID. Um, the forecasting challenges obviously become uh, qualitatively harder. Uh, some would argue they become impossible. Uh, I think COVID, you know, some people call it a black swan, but if you go back to the historical record, it clearly doesn't qualify as a black swan. Uh, you have microbiology textbooks in 2002 and 2005 warning explicitly about it. You have Bill Gates giving a TED talk in 2015 warning about it. You have lots of epidemiologists chattering about it over the last so the idea that there could be a zoonotic uh, pandemic uh, that claims uh, millions of lives, uh, that idea has been around for a long time. We, and we know things like that have happened in the past. Um, so, you know, the, the challenge there is how skillfully can your system handle you know, chronic, relatively low probability yearly risks? So let's say you know that the elite virologists and epidemiologists and so forth would tell you that you know, somewhere between a two and a five percent probability in any given year it's going to come from central China, but you know th th that was the most the, the prime suspect. Um, it's not necessarily going to come from there, but but what any source you know a zoonotic pandem pandemic, and uh, they, they give you a two to five percent probability range. Uh, and that accumulates year after year. Well, what we know about human beings is they, you know, they hear, they hear it, they hear it, they hear it, and you know what? They tune it out pretty quickly. Uh, and that's indeed what happened with emergency preparedness in the United States, both the U.S. government and the city of New York and so forth. They actually had been down, downgrading their emergency preparedness for a pandemic prior to this, uh, which is, you know, pretty much exactly the opposite of what you should be doing uh, when you have a cumulative long-term risk like that. Um, but it's very hard to get people to persuade to persuade people to pay attention to low probabilities. Now, something happened in late 2019 that that two that chronic two to five percent probability range uh, began to change in the fall of 2019. And the intelligence community gets blamed for lots of things for missing that and missing this. But here, you know, they were really, I, I think, quite quite prescient. And they were warning the administration in the fall of 2019. I think probably intelligence services in other countries were as well. Uh, but they were warning 
uh, that the, 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 there are ominous things happening in central China, and they became increasingly ominous as the fall went on. So, so you would imagine a good, you know, regular belief updating super forecaster types it should have been um, updating their probabilities. Well, you know, it's not really two to five percent anymore. It's more like around maybe it's ten percent now, and ten percent still sounds small to people. Like, okay, now maybe it's up to fifteen or twenty. Um, you need to take into account, of course, the impact. You know, a two to five percent probability of something that disrupted is actually very ominous um, when you compute the expected value. So. Um, uh, I don't know, my, I, I've been meandering here a bit, but I, I think that's the most direct current connection I can make to this gray, white, gray, black swan continuum idea. And, uh, and it's the change too, I suppose. If it's, if it's going from two to three or so, and then it goes up to 10, we should be paying a lot more attention. Yeah. yeah. And generate more forecast questions to track. Um, I just one or two more here with our with the time we have. Um, oh well, here's an easy one. What things can hedgehogs do to become more fox-like? Would the world be a better place with foxes getting more press coverage? I can address the second one. Yes. <laughs> well, um, in, in, indeed. I mean, my earlier work on expert political judgment, we did find that the, the media do prefer uh, experts who offer crisp sound bites and crisp sound bites are more likely to come from hedgehogs who are advocates of one big idea than they are from foxes who play with many smaller ideas uh, and um, often appear somewhat inconsistent. Um, so the media question is pretty easy. Uh, the question of how to change minds is much harder. Um, and I would, you know, when I was talking about full inference cycle tournaments, I said the first phase of a full inference cycle tournament is each camp is required to demonstrate that it can accurately represent the perspective of the other camp. Uh, you don't, you can't jumpstart a constructive uh, full inference cycle forecasting tournament unless each camp commits to um, faithfully representing the perspective of the other camp to the other camp satisfaction. Um, that's sometimes called the ideological Turing test. Um, you know, you, 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 you couldn't tell. I'm a, I'm a liberal, but you couldn't tell that uh, it was just being a conservative. It sounded just like a, like, a, like a very convincing conservative position and vice versa. Uh, so I think doing that, engaging in perspective taking exercises of that sort, you know, showing you can be a good method actor in the political sphere or the economic sphere, or whatever sphere you work in, uh, showing you can do that is, um, good mental practice. Uh, I think it is likely to improve your aggregate forecasting accuracy over the long term, and it's probably going to make you a more reasonable conversational partner as well. Um, there's one more here that maybe fits into that, um, and that is uh, uh, what similarities and differences do you see between historical counterfactual thinking versus counterfactual analysis of a decision making process and uh, the parenthetical is counterfactuals in postmortems. <clears throat> I love like, this is a question near and dear to my heart because it's so central to the spiritual core of the focus research program. Uh, why are we doing everything all the weird things we're doing in the focus tournament with simulations? Um, and the original goal was to improve the postmortem process inside the intelligence community, uh, to improve what if reasoning from history inside the, in, inside the IC when they asked. So, you know, what would have happened if we had um, 1992, if we had listened to those people who had recommended a Marshall Plan for Russia when it was coming right out of communism, helping them with the privatization process, which was very messy and led to the oligarchs and and, and eventually Putin, um, what would have happened if we had been as generous in 1992, the EU and the US had combined resources and had been as generous in 1992 as the US was, say, in 1947 with the Marshall Plan, uh, with the reconstruction of Europe from World War II. And you know that's a counterfactual because we didn't do it. And we wound up with what we did. And what you find is quite interesting what you discover there. You discover that uh, the, 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 as Warren was alluding to with Victor Gorbachev, uh, that, that the experts fall into quite 
into, into pattern camps, into camp, into well-defined camps. Uh, there are those who say, you know what, it wouldn't have made much of a difference at all. You would have wound up with the same, roughly the same oligarchic arrangement um, and eventual authoritarianism. And other people say, you know what, it could have made a big difference. It could be a relatively uh, peaceful, democratic Russia that's non-threatening toward its neighbors and has a good relationship with the EU and NATO, maybe isn't part of the EU by now. Um, so those are radically different futures, right? That, and they're, count they're counterfactuals. Nobody can go back in a time machine. Nobody can run them. But here's what we do know. We do know, so I know, we know, we know that, you know, there are hawks and doves and owls on Russia, and we know that they give different answers to the Marshall Plan counterfactual question. We don't know who's right. We don't know who's wrong because we can't write rerun history. But here's what we can do. We can construct conditional forecasting questions that correlate with people's, uh, that people answer in ways that are correlated with their counterfactual beliefs. So you can create a kind of a causal model, Bayesian inference diagram thing, in which you can, well, you know what? People who think that the Marshall Plan would have made no difference are also people who are more likely to favor uh, tough sanctions against Putin and his cronies. Uh, they're more likely to favor uh, aggressive military aid to the Ukraine and the Baltics. They're more likely to favor doing, um, uh, making strong measures on Belarus um, and so forth. A long list of things. It, uh, insofar as you find that, you can, so you can set up a forecasting tournament that begins to shed indirect light on which camp, which view of history is associated with making more or less accurate conditional forecasts going forward. Uh, and I think that's an interesting process. It's, it's part of what we call full entrance cycle tournaments, uh, where you know you that you learn to just accurately the other side's counterfactual beliefs. Um, and I think it's a way of um, getting out of this impasse. You know, each side gets to make up its own counterfactuals because nobody has a time machine, right? And nobody can check. Uh, it it turn, makes the counterfactuals a little more uh, testable and uh, resolvable uh, against evidence. And I think that is a step forward. Great, yeah, I'm, 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 I love this stuff um, and appreciate getting a, a closer insight. I've got just one last question because we're, uh, we're, and then we'll hand over to Tom. This has been terrific, and I thank you, everyone who's been putting in questions. I hope I got to most of them, if not all of them. Uh, but just the one last one, uh, Phil, is how did it come to be that a professional poker player joined the Focus Research Team? Well, I would start by saying we're very grateful to Annie for the support she's given the Focus Research Team, and uh, you'll 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 discover just how how um, how collegial and creative Annie is uh, in the next hour. Um, we really appreciate everything she's done for us, um, and um, Annie's had a very interesting career, um, and it's a very interesting question about how transportable the reasoning skills are from poker to other spheres of life. It's, this, it's the same basic problem we're dealing with in focus. I mean, if I can make you a better counterfactual forecaster in one type of simulation, like, like say Mark Zuckerberg, one of Mark Zuckerberg's favorite games, Civ, Civ 5, Civ 6, uh, if I can make you better on that, can I also make you better on recon blind chess and can I make you better on an epidemiological forecasting simulation and so forth? And the answer is it's very choppy. It's very hard to get strong transfer effects across these very different simulated worlds. And Annie thought long and hard and deeply about what are the most interesting transportable reasoning skills from a game like poker to life. Uh, it's represented in her books and most recent book, of course, How to Decide. And um, you'll, you'll, you'll get some very interesting insights from her. And I really appreciate everything she's done for us.